All right, welcome back to the Analog Sci-Fi Book Review Podcast. Uh, I've got another uh, sci-fi book here to cover. It is Olson Scott Card's Ender's Game. Ender's Game was written in uh, 1985, and it is a hell of a book. I really, really enjoyed this one. Um, I remember reading the short story um, probably in something akin to like an analog um sci-fi uh paperback um and it was just the short story where it was just um ender um at battle school and if i do remember i think it it just does like a battle school thing and then um we're we're brought into the the bugger battle um which is essentially the end of the book here itself um and the trick is revealed and um yeah, even even then, it was um, something that I really, really um, gravitated towards because the uh, the voice in the book, um, Ender, who is um, pretty much um, we're in his head. Um, if you've ever read um, something like um, what is it, uh, A Catcher in the Rye, uh, Ender's Game is going to feel really close to uh, the um, stuck in the um, the voice of the character where you're in his head. Um, and Ender is, well, I, I'm just talking about it without really kind of getting to the plot, but the, um, the plot of the book is essentially we, uh, were dropped into, um, a, uh, Terra or, uh, an earth that's recently, um, experienced a, essentially like a nine 11, uh, style event. But the only difference to that is not, it's not terrorism. It's a, um, alien invasion. And, um, we just barely win. And, um, they, uh, they disband and we regroup. And when we're dropped into the story, um, the world, um, is much more, uh, material, uh, uh militaristic and, uh, uh, probably, uh, fascistic, um, in its way of thinking. Um, citizenship seems to be reduced. Um, there are, um, uh, child rationing where, um, people are only allowed to have one kid and the state allows you to have uh, a second or a third kid, like basically on the basis of, um, that next child's probability to add value to society. Um, so in reading it, it feels very close to something like uh, Starship Troopers and how a, um, military society can really, um, take over and change the nature of citizenship and make, um, military rule not necessarily feel like a prison, um, physically, but change um how society is structured and how uh society views the individual um in that way um much like in heinland's uh starship troopers which i plan to read uh and cover here um is the how the individual um in ender's game and much like in starship troopers trumps society um, the individual is king. And in that way, um, society is saved, um, not by the banding together of group, but by the military genius of the individual. And that's Ender. So in having to wrap around the world that um, Olsen Scott Card builds, um, he creates he creates a world after um the alien invasion of the buggers the buggers are again it's it, it feels so if enders if if starship troopers is the book about the frontline battle enders game is about what's happening back on earth um half of this book feels like it's it's in or on earth 
while the other half is with Ender um, at the space station, um, going through battle school, going through command school, um, off world. Um, more of this book happens on Earth than I expected. And and this is going to be a long review, but this is this is that part of the book that's on Terra on Earth is, in my opinion, the most interesting part um, where we follow um, Ender's um, brother and sister. Um, I knew that they were characters. Um, they're referenced in the short story, but they're they're so fleshed out and they're such real people. Um, but back to what I was saying about, um, if, if, um, Starship Troopers was about the, um, frontline, um, foot soldier, um, Ender's game is about the, the general, <laughs> the general at that battle and what's going through his mind and, um, how he has to, ration um ships and ration persons and make decisions that ultimately lead to people's deaths but <clears throat> much like Heinland, um this is a book about where the ends justify the means and whether that's okay that's your interpretation but the decisions the characters make in the story um are for the greater good but also come at a cost and that cost is the individual uh an ender so that all being said we follow ender um as he is wondering whether he's being selected to move forward in the program um and lack of a better better metaphor move upstairs and um justify his um, existence essentially because he's a third born um it i'm gonna ha jump back and forth but essentially we we start off on terra we meet his brother and we meet his sister um and his brother uh is the first born he's a, a few years older um these are all children so i think he's maybe 13 and he flunked out of the program um for being too aggressive um he lacked any empathy and that was what i believe um brought him out of the program and so when they decided that they uh commissioned uh ender's parents to um birth uh, a daughter so that daughter uh it, it's essentially just like a you know the porridge is too hot the porridge is too cold um Ender's sister was too uh, passive or too meek, um, not, not in an anti-feminist way, but just, you know, in the way that um, Ender's brother was too aggressive or too masculine, too toxic. You know, she bent the other way. Um, they're both hyper intelligent. Um, they're, re they're, they're written to be hyper intelligent. And um, there are moments in the book where... Um, even Alston Scott Card forces you to to realize that they're children through the lens of their parents. Um, their parents, I think, are just average people, um, and they're doing they're doing things. They're talking about things that end up actually shaping um, public opinion and the world, um, like at the breakfast table. <laughs> so, like the mom is, you know, making sure that they go to school or like you know finish their breakfast, um, all while they're you know, reshaping history. Um, so again, we start off with the book um, with the sister and the brother and the brother's being very aggressive to Ender. Um, Ender feels like he's not valuable because he's most likely, he feels like he's not going to be selected to go forward um, and be part of battle school. Um, the brother is physically uh, abusive um, to Ender. And the call comes in and he's selected. Um, the sister's un unusually supportive and he goes forward, um, takes a ship up, goes to the space station and ends up in battle school. Um, the battle school is, oh, let me backtrack. There's an event that happens that, um, I guess justifies, um, Ender's, um, selection of the program that potentially if this didn't happen, he probably wouldn't have been selected into a uh, battle school is a, a handful of kids um, harass Ender. And um, Ender, again, in, in the point of view of, you know, what's in his head is, you know, we see the rationalization um, of Ender 
you know, deciding to end a fight um, that ends up in the death of that student. Um, but his rationale is that, you know, because of his size or, you know, his perceived meekness, that um, if if he didn't handle the fight in a way that, you know, uh, essentially put an end to it, um, it would be something that would continuously uh, affect him. So he makes the conscious decision to move past, you know, hurt, move past um, pain and, and send a message. Um, and again, that results in the death of, of the student. But Ender, um, Ender doesn't know that. And he doesn't know that um, because he's he's he it's it's manufactured for him not to know. And that's to me. It's a dense book and there's a lot of themes that you can pull from it. But one aspect of the book that um, I found that was really um, unusual and in a positive way was the value of lies. And. <laughs> How, how knowing the whole picture isn't necessarily beneficial to the goal. And I, I and not being in the military, um, I know I would have trouble not understanding the big picture if I was a foot soldier. And that probably would make me a bad soldier. But um, in this way... Um, what is hidden from Ender is given um, a lot more weight at the end of the book because if he had known all aspects and all angles and um, things that were in the darkness were brought into the light, he probably wouldn't have been successful. And that's really interesting and um, supports some um, macro um, themes, not themes, but concepts um, that are validated in the book, um, things like um, game-based learning, um, uh, silly things like uh, the value of violence, um, even though Ender at the end becomes a um, rational pacifist. Um, it's a, it's a, let me put it this way. If you were... If you were a person that felt as if uh, the Iraq war was justified and that, you know, in the rationale, if there was a 1% chance, you know, we better take it as an absolute certainty. This book, this book affirms those thoughts and, you know, um, Ender has to grapple with the ramifications of that way of thinking. Um but not to jump ahead to the end of the book. But um, so Ender has that fight that moves him um, into battle school. He moves into battle school. He, um, in through his point of view, we understand that he is most likely given a um, altered experience um, than say the other kids that are in there. Um, each each kid is under the age of 13 they're very young they're very bright um and they're all they're all the goal is to is to be the commander um of all armies um to fight the buggers they know that they want to be that but they don't necessarily know how um the instructors or the generals are um manipulating their um environment Socially, physically, um, everything that's happening to them um, is by design. So Ender is aware that um, he is put into places where he has the disadvantage um, in a simple way. If, um, if he woke up one morning and he didn't have any socks, it was because the instructors took it away from him as a test. Um, there are all aspects of the book where Ender is certain that he's, um, he's put in a place where he has uh, one arm tied behind his back. We see him assimilate in battalion or, um, in, in, um, platoons. Uh, we see him, uh, assimilate platoons. Um, and each platoon is, um, broken down by a color and an animal. It's very, um, legends of the hidden temple. 
So, um, like, uh, one's like, you know, red salamander, you know, and uh, the one that he ends up commanding is dragon. Um, and you know, we see, and this is what I, what I loved about the point. And, and cause I feel like it breaks into two books, right? There's the Terra and then there's the battle school on the battle school front. Um, learning about the different, um, leadership styles that, um, all of the lieutenants that, um, are above Ender before he takes his kind of like lieutenantship and, and takes a, um, um, platoon and, um, goes into the zero gravity, um, battle, um, room is how, how different all of the, um, lieutenants, uh, styles are because, um, well, just to kind of jump ahead a bit. So, so we, um, we were, we're introduced to this concept called the bat, uh, the battle room and the battle room. Um, again, they're, they're in like a space station. And so it's a room that's, um, zero G and they're given, uh, laser guns and, um, suits that they're unaware of. And so like, it, like this is just, they're just dropped in. It's like, Oh, here's a, here's a room where, you know, there's zero gravity and here's the suits and here's the gun. They don't tell them anything. So, you know, they're jumped, they're thrown in and floating around. Um, and Ender, you know, puts two and two together and it's like, oh, shoot me in the foot. <laughs> and uh, when he shoot, when this friend shoots him in the foot, his uh, his his foot goes frozen. And so the suit is designed to um, solidify you <laughs> um, or, you know, freeze you in a way. Um, laser tag freeze, but in zero G. So, uh you're you're put in you're put into this room where on opposite opposite sides like a chessboard you have um one battalion and the other battalion and you know they meet in the middle and have a laser laser battle and it's kind of like um all right if you get one of your guys through to the other person's like um uh hatch at the other end they uh, you win um but how how you go about it communicates a lot about you so um you might have one one leader like a leader salamander um who's all about formations and uh, you know it's a it's 100 percent offensive um and then you'll have one guy who um hangs back you know and is solely defensive um but ender and and that's what i what i, what I love about it, the character himself um, I'm empathetic to him to his experience, but what I, what I liked about him was he, his ability to be creative. Um, and I, I feel like in being a creative guy, I feel like people think that creativity is sometimes inherently, um, graphical, um, and you know, oh, I'm not a good drawler or I don't know how to take a good picture or, you know, this and that. And so they, they, they don't think about how creativity can, um, be a concept inter that introduces into their life that can change them. Um, you know, you could be an engineer and be, and be a creative engineer. Um, and so, and, you know, Ender outside of him being a intelligent guy and, um, um, a good general, his ability to uh, be adaptable and, um, seek, um, inventive ways of, um, of attacking his enemy or um, um, using the environment or just being inventive and um, thinking outside of the box and implementing those things. Um, and being a guy that, that I, I, I like, I like coming up with an idea that no one else in the room has come up with seeing, seeing a character um, be validated um, for thinking outside the box um, cause it's also cool. <laughs> I mean, um, on the way of the, you know, the free suits, he ends up, um, in one tactic, he, um, freezes a buddy like a surfboard and rides him, uh, cause it's zero G right. And just kind of like, like a single shot, like, um, and uses his body as a defense, you know, like, like, like a rug, almost like a magic, like, like he's like a flying carpet. <laughs> Um, and because, because the enemy wasn't expecting that something as smooth as just like a, a, a downfield pass, he won that round, but, and to, and to hear it and see it described and imagine it 
is, uh, you know, it was funny. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, so, I mean, we, we follow Ender and he passes battle school, but that happens and we jump back and forth in chapters. And again, this is what I find is the most interesting part is we follow the brother and the sister back on earth talking about problems, uh, back on earth about like, oh, the bugger war and, um, geopolitical issues um you know being this written in 1985 um you know the cold war is still happening um nations are making moves on the basis of you know the success or failure of the bugger war you know if oh if if they if we go to the bugger planet and we lose russia i guess will take over the world you know, like that, that kind of simplistic, um, explanation of the narrative. But, you know, we, we follow, we follow the brother and sister and, and again, it's 1985 and what they do essentially is the brother and sister go onto social media and, uh, with fake identities um, pretending to be adults that have um, credentials and a political view and such, and uh, essentially change public opinion. And again, it's 1985, and they're talking about the you know the internet, you know, and it's not just some like a you know this um, matrixy thing, you know, uh, cyberpunk, you know, it's cyber it's cyberpunk without the punk. Um, just to think of just to think and see. And understand how someone in 1985 who maybe just uh, understood a computer and, you know, probably maybe could just send an email, you know, at that time, understood that we would have communication forums um, akin to Facebook or akin to Reddit or akin to, you know, um, message boards, which I think is essentially kind of what's being depicted. Um, and that we would have a, a global communication network that um, that people could have a fake identity on. And that's interesting because that happens. That's happening right now. And, um, you know, that's 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 kind of also just, you know, in a roundabout way, why I have the podcast is to is to read these stories and, and not only enjoy them, but to really think about it and how how they were able to get so many things right and um and and have themes that feel still relevant today where you know the the buggers attack the earth and instead of trying to have diplomacy we're having a, a discussion about preemptive strike which is the Iraq war <laughs> um and you know in a in a in a uh, simplistic way, you know, those the, the brother and sister are creating fake news, <laughs> and um, you know, false identities, and you know, um, just communicating on social media, and you know, even those, even that, even that, even though it is a one sentence explanation to you know, one hundred twenty pages of the book, it's so interesting when you read it. Um, and where you're able to, um, you know, stop and realize it's like, oh, this is, you know, the, the character is a 12 year old kid. Um, but he is moving, moving society forward, um, with his ideas. Um, the sister's fearful that the brother, um, will assume power, uh, and become, I guess, essentially a dictator. And that moves the story into, I guess, more of the series, um, outside of Ender, the, uh, like Shadow of the Hegemon, uh, which I, I, in reading this, I, I have, um, where is it? I guess I don't have it. Um, Speaker of the Dead, which is the follow-up book to this. Um, I want to read uh, Shadow of the Hegemon more, um, and I don't necessarily want to be taken off world and, um, where the story ends up going, he does go off world. Um, and I guess I found that a little disappointing, not that it was, um, it just wasn't where I thought it was going. 
I thought maybe Andrew was going to come down to earth and uh, become some kind of messiah, which he kind of does. But he doesn't he doesn't want to be on earth. He wants to be somewhere. He wants to go out into the galaxy. Um, so the brothers uh, wants to be a dictator. The sisters feeling bad. Uh, Ender um, is being successful in battle school. Um, he um, becomes a lieutenant. Uh, one distinctive point in the game or in the, the book is he's, um, I guess in the evenings, he's allowed to play computer games. Um, but to what I pretty much, I, I believe is probably a tablet or some kind of laptop, like, you know, like a laptop. Um, and he's given a game where he plays as a mouse and, um, there's a giant and the giant says, Oh, there's two, two vials in front of you there. One, one will take you to, you know, fairyland, which I think, yeah, take you to fairyland. The other one will kill you. And, uh, it always kills him. And, you know, no matter what he picks, it's a left, right. It's, I think the, if I remember from the movie, the, the point of view is it's like, how is he dealing with stress or something like that? You know, it's a, um, it's an unwinnable game. Uh, so in this unwinnable game, um, Ender, who um, doesn't like losing, and again, in his point of view, because we're in his head, um, he's like, you know, he's, he's, he's obsessed with winning because that's the only incentive he's given. So, you know, if the only endorphin kick, the only endorphin kick that and the only satisfaction you, you're given is to win, um, He's always get he's his, his constant mental incentive is to win, 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 win. Um, so the two vials, he's a mouse. There's a giant. What he does is he moves the mouse up the up the arm and body of the giant, and the uh, commands the mouse to attack the the giant's eyeball. Uh, barrow, bar, burrows into the um, the giant's head and kills it. Um, on the basis that he knows that the that the generals and the instructors only validate him by his acts of violence, um, which is shocking. Um, more shocking probably than the event itself. Like the depiction of the burrowing is like his like okay, they only give a shit if I'm violent, so I'm gonna be violent and. It, and this is why the end justifies the means and why it feels like that, that's a center point of the book in a very thematic way, because, you know, at the end, he justifies the means with violence and validate and he's validated for it. Um, so on that game, and I believe the death of the uh, Salamander lieutenant, um, because uh, Ender keeps beating him through, uh, you know, just inventive tactics. Um, Ender gets in a fight with him and, you know, um, I think he, the, the Salamander guy falls wrong or hits his head um, on like a slippery surface and he dies. Very similar to the um, uh, uh, student. Uh, he dies too. Uh, but Ender doesn't know that. And again, it's just another example of the, the lies, uh, the effective lies. So he's brought into command school and um, he meets up with the guy that um, caused the success of uh, the, the last bugger war. And, you know, Ender's watching videos and, you know, taking um, lessons from uh, the main guy that won the last time. And they're uh, they're giving him uh, simulations that uh, simulate the, uh, f the the future battle of you know going to the the bugger home world and um, uh, destroying it. Uh, so Ender goes through all of these events. You know, some he wins, some he loses. Um, all his friends uh, that, that worked well with him uh, in battle school are, you know, in position. It's interesting because we we when we get to that point where he is, um, you know, the shadow general of the command. Um, we see him empathize 
with um, his uh, underlings. Um, say like if there was a particular moment where um, one of the underlings made a bad call and a bunch of ships got destroyed, he knew that he lost her or him forever or that, that they, they weren't going to try as hard. And, and, and it's those little things in the book that make, um, they make it so rich because they don't feel like people that, um, dust off and, you know, they're not Captain America. They don't, you know, they don't say that line. What's that line? Um, I could do this all day. They can't. And that's what's so interesting about it. And it's so interesting about the book is that they feel not, and not like in that cliche way, they feel like real people. They feel, they feel like that. They feel like even though they win, everyone's broken. Everyone. And, um, that they're going, that, Everyone isn't going to, you know, go to therapy and feel better or that, you know, essentially they're just going to pick it up and, and do another day. But with with all the pain and damage of yesterday and that's where you're pretty much left at the end of the book, because all of the simulations that Ender's been doing, um, essentially pretending to be the commander, that he's actually been the commander He's been the commander the whole time and that when he went to command school and he was put into the simulations, all of his actions actually manifested. And so we're put in a place um, where all of the instructors are watching him in this last test. Well, the last test is, is it is, and they're at the bugger world and um, you know, the, 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 the main instructor guy from the the previous um, bugger invasion, you know, tells him, you know, oh, this is going to be the last test. Um, the only variable is the bugger world, and um, you know they're watching them. And Ender does a an inventive move because he knows that you know the incentive is to stop the buggers completely. And completely in a um, holistic, um, genocidal way, because that's what the incentive is. So instead of focusing his attention on the individual ships and having a one-to-one -one ship battle that he ultimately would lose because there's just not the numbers, the numbers are against him, that he positions his Death Star weaponry, essentially, at the planet itself and destroys it. And everything on it. And they're super excited about it. they like, oh, we won the game. And uh, the veil is broken. And Ender killed an entire race of um, creatures, aliens, uh, in one fell swoop. And he feels terrible about it. And um, one other aspect that, that um, usually... Uh, when we're when we jump back into the um, um, battle school, uh, we start a ch we start the chapter um, with like a closed door conversation between the instructors and the generals and stuff, and you know it's it's them. It doesn't make sense until you understand at the very end what's happened, um, but that they are lying to him and that. You know, conversations about like, oh, we'll be, get, we'll be court martialed for what we've done, you know, so like, you know, playing the pronoun game essentially until we know what the pronoun or what the noun is. Um, and essentially, uh, you know, Ender, you know, disowns and just denounces, you know, the instructors because he feels like he's committed genocide. And, um, in the same way of the Iraq war or, you know, the ends justifies, justifies the means of wars, um, they don't get court-martialed or they, they, you know, they get acquitted essentially. And, um, you know, the, those, those moral stains live on. And that's probably why I also I want to read Shadow of the Hegemon is because I just want to understand what's happening back on Terra once the bugger wars ended. Um, and, um, on a last note, um, 
and I and I remember this from the movie, and I do plan to do a um, movie book comparison um, because I don't know if I like the movie. And in in actually finishing the book, uh, I finished it about two or three weeks ago because I'd watched the movie um, on Tubi uh, maybe two months ago, and I I liked it, but I didn't. I wasn't sure if I really really liked it. Um, or if I felt like maybe it was a watered down version of it. Um, but one aspect that I was so surprised by it was, um, Ender essentially taking the egg of, uh, of a queen, uh, bugger and, um, you know, his desire seeming to find a habitable planet for it to hatch. And the sense that that was the end of the book, I, I couldn't, I, or yeah, that the end of the book or the end of the story, I just couldn't believe it. I, I, I like I said I I expected Ender to come back to Earth, and you know become supreme leader of you know of Earth or something, but the the thought that he took that egg and left, um, I guess I'm gonna have to read Speaker of the Dead just to make sure um, it's as interesting as Olson Scott Card must have thought it was. Um, yeah, so I mean, when it comes to Ender's Game, uh, it's a great book. So I mean, this is a very easy thumbs up, big thumbs up. Um, I uh, I have Speaker of the Dead, so I'm planning to read that. But I inherently want to uh, read Shadow of the Hegemon. Uh, I don't necessarily want to read a um, uh, Ender's Shadow because uh, I feel like I've already read it. But I do want to know what happens back on Earth, and um, yeah, so uh, you know, keep it keep it locked, and uh, I'll probably have uh, Speaker of the Dead uh, up in maybe a month or two, uh, and uh, I'll probably move on to the Foundation series uh, next because uh, I really enjoyed those. But uh, yeah, Ender's Game. Um, if I had to uh, give it an alternative name. I probably would call it Crusher, because uh, that's what he does. He crushes. Um, all of his incentives are for Ender is to crush. And if you are the kind of person that likes um, very literary heavy, um, very symbol uh, symbolism heavy, um, something that has a lot more uh, geopolitical um, teeth, uh, Ender's Game is the book. So, uh, again, this is an analog sci-fi book review, and uh, I just covered Ender's Game by also Scott Card. All those give me your moments are be lost in time. Go infinity and beyond. Tears. Like the love of you.